Up until now, we've been focusing on the angles at which constructive interference can occur, which leads to diffraction of X-ray radiation. And as we have learned, that tells us about the size and shape of the unit cell. It tells us about the translational symmetry of our crystal. But if we want to say anything about where the atoms are located within the unit cell, then we have to analyze the intensities of the diffraction peaks. So to illustrate this, let's go back to the structure of alpha polonium, which we encountered a few lectures ago. And remember that alpha polonium has a very simple structure. It is one atom per unit cell, and that atom is located on the corners of a primitive cubic lattice. And here is the simulated powder diffraction pattern for alpha polonium. And we can see some general features. We see that in general the peaks are stronger at low angles and weaker at high angles. But there's more to the story than that. So as we consider the various factors that influence the intensity of a diffraction peak, we're going to use alpha polonium as an illustrative example. Mathematically, we can say that the intensity of each reflection or each diffraction peak is given by this formula. If we start with the first term, this k squared, well, k is just a scale factor. Ultimately, what we care about are the relative intensities of the peaks, which ones are strong and which ones are weak. But of course, if you do a diffraction experiment, the absolute intensity of your peak is going to depend on things like how long did you measure for? What is the size of your crystal? What about various parameters of your instrument? And this scale factor k is going to be the same for every diffraction peak in the pattern. Then we come to this term, f squared. f squared is called the structure factor, and it is far and away the most important term in this expression. f squared tells us about the interference effects that comes from atoms that are located at different points in the unit cell. So ultimately, when we're trying to determine the crystal structure, the f squared is the key term that contains all of the information about the positions of the atoms. P and L are the polarization and Lorentz factors, and those are theta-dependent. We'll talk about those more in a minute. Then we have M, the multiplicity factor, which is something we have to deal with in powder diffraction experiments, but not in single crystal diffraction experiments. And then finally, we have what's called an absorption correction. Most matter is pretty highly absorbing for x-rays, and as the x-rays travel through the sample and are absorbed, that's going to impact our peak intensities. Let's now go a little bit deeper into each one of these terms. All right, so up to this point, we have been talking about scattering where we had atoms on lattice points. And in that condition, remember we said if we had a line of scatterers and we had an X-ray beam that came in and was diffracted off of that line of scatterers, that if we had an incoming angle theta and an outgoing angle theta that were equal, then we're going to get constructive interference. Further, we said if we had scattering off of another plane of atoms, there were certain distances between these two planes that led to constructive interference, and that's described by Bragg's law. Now, what happens if we were to put an atom at another place, not on a lattice point? Let's say we were to put an atom at that location in the unit cell. Well, x-rays are going to be scattered off of that atom as well, and it should be pretty apparent to you that these x-rays are going to have a different path length than the x-rays that are scattered off the lower plane of atoms here. And because of that, when we're at the condition where Bragg's law is met, the presence of more than one atom in the unit cell is going to lead to some degree of destructive interference between the waves. And that destructive interference is going to affect the peak intensities, and analyzing those intensities is going to tell us about where the atoms are located in the unit cell. This is a topic in and of itself, and in two lectures from now, we're going to get into the structure factor in more detail. For now, we just know that it's something that contains the information about the atoms in the unit cell. In the case of polonium, where we have only a single atom in the unit cell, 
there are no interference effects to take into account. And so the structure factor just becomes the atomic form factor of polonium squared. And so if we were to plot the atomic form factor as a function of theta, we would get something that looks like this. Remember that at zero degrees two theta, the atomic form factor is just equal to the number of electrons in the element, and polonium is element 84. So at zero degrees two theta, F squared is just 84 squared. But as we go to higher angles, because there are interference effects that come from electrons scattering x-rays at different points in the volume of a polonium atom, then the form factor drops off. Okay? And so we can see over the angular range in this pattern, the form factor squared drops off by about a factor of three. And so that is largely responsible for the fact that the intensities of these peaks are generally decreasing as we go to higher two theta angles. However, it does not explain you know, some of the ups and downs that we see along the way. What are the other factors we are thinking about here? If we go back a few lectures when we were talking about elastic scattering of x-rays by electrons and atoms, you will recall that an electron does not scatter x-rays equally in all directions depending on the polarization of the incoming beam, that is, which electric field directions are allowed, there is an angular dependence to it. And so if we have an unpolarized X-ray beam, as you would have in most laboratory X-ray sources, then you get this one plus cosine squared two theta dependence. Maximum scattering in the forward and back scattering directions, and then only half that scattering at the two theta equals 90 degrees. So if we were to plot that term as a function of theta or two theta, we would get this plot, and you can see that it reaches a minimum at 90 degrees. One thing to remember with the polarization factor is there are many kinds of experiments where we don't have a completely unpolarized beam. So if you're doing an experiment at a synchrotron source, well then, that light is not completely unpolarized, and so you have to account for that. If your incident beam bounces off a monochromator so that you select only one very specific wavelength, that's also going to change your polarization. So under certain circumstances, we have to use a different polarization correction. The next term we want to look at is called the Lorentz factor. And the Lorentz factor, like polarization, is dependent only on the scattering angle theta or two theta. And it takes into account a variety of geometric things. One of the things that the Lorentz factor does is that if you had a crystal and you turned it very, very slowly in an X-ray beam, you know, and at certain angles you would find that you satisfy the Laue equations and you would see diffraction. Well, as the crystal rotates, you know, the width and intensity of your diffraction peak is going to change. You know, as Girolami says in his book, the length of time which the crystal sparkles at certain angles is going to be different at different angles. So it turns out that this dependence is 1 over sine 2 theta, which means that the Lorentz factor is large at low values of theta and also when we get near the backscattering condition. Now in a powder experiment, there's actually other theta-dependent things that get put into the Lorentz factor. So the two other effects that we have to take account is that even if we have a completely random orientation of our crystals, that the number of crystals that happen to be oriented properly for diffraction is actually dependent on cosine theta. So it's larger at low angles than it is as we go to higher angles. And then also remember that in a diffraction experiment, the physics of what's happening is that the crystals are scattering x-rays in cones. And in our detector, we're taking just a slice of that cone. So when the cone is very small, we're taking a bigger slice of the cone than when the cone gets large. And that gives us a 1 over sine 2 theta term. If you combine all three of these terms and do a little trigonometry, you can come up with this correction. 1 over 4 times sine squared theta times cosine theta. And if we were to plot that as a function of theta versus our diffraction pattern of polonium, we can see this kind of a ter term that drops off 
rather sharply at the lower angles, and then it, there's a slight rise as we get to higher angles. Oftentimes, the Lorentz and polarization terms are combined because both are theta-dependent terms that have no relationship to the details of our crystal. And when you do that, you get this kind of a term. So for the most part, we don't really think about this. It doesn't tell us anything about our crystal. But you can see that we have to make this correction before we think about those f squared values. Because the Lorentz polarization factor varies by maybe a factor of 15 or 20 over the angular range of our experiment. Now, so far, all of the terms we've talked about have had a rather smooth angular dependence. We had the drop-off in the form factor. We t looked at the Lorentz and the polarization factors. And those factors together, there's no way that they can explain some of these ups and downs that we see in the diffraction pattern of polonium. So how do we account for that? To account for those features, we have to remember that in a powder diffraction experiment, where we see a peak is oftentimes multiple peaks on top of one another. So think about a cubic crystal, and if we were doing a single crystal diffraction experiment and our incident X-ray beam is coming into the crystal parallel to the 0, 0, 1 direction in the crystal, parallel to the C-axis. And if you did that, you would get this kind of diffraction pattern. And in a powder diffraction experiment, all of that information is actually condensed down into one dimension. And the only thing that really matters is the distance from our direct beam to these diffraction peaks. And so where we have diffraction peaks that are on a circle of constant radius, those are all going to be equivalent reflections. So we see the 1, 0, 0, the 0, 1, 0, the 1 bar 0, 0, and the 0, 1 bar 0. Right? Those peaks in a powder diffraction experiment all occur at exactly the same angle. If we go out to a little bit larger radius, we would see you know, the 1, 1, 0 type reflections. And so we have to take this into account when we look at a powder diffraction experiment. We can call reflections that occur at the same d-spacing and are permutations of the same set of integers with minus signs thrown in as equivalent reflections. If we have a cubic crystal, we could calculate the d-spacing from this formula. And of course, the d-spacing tells us the angle at which we're going to see the peak in a powder diffraction experiment. And you can see that if h, k, and l, if one of those three numbers is either 1 or minus 1, and the other two are 0, they're all going to give exactly the same value for d, h, k, l. And so we see that these six reflections are all equivalent to one another, and they all occur at exactly the same place in a powder pattern. So we would say that the 1, 0, 0 class of reflections has a multiplicity of 6. There are always going to be 6 diffraction peaks that occur at the same spot. And those are shown here. But if we were to go to the 1, 1, 0, then actually the multiplicity becomes 12. And the reason why is because, you know, in part, a 0 can't be positive or negative, so that number of zeros in the HKL values matters. And then also it matters whether two of the indices are the same or different. So we see different kinds of multiplicities. You know, if we have a 1, 1, 1 peak, which is the next one in our powder pattern, its multiplicity is 8. And if we have just a general HKL, where HK and L are all different from one another, and none of them are 0, the multiplicity goes up to 48. So if we come back to our powder diffraction pattern for polonium and look at the multiplicities of the different reflections, now we start to understand these alternations in the peak intensities. So this peak, the 2, 0, 0, which is weaker than its neighbors, is weaker because its multiplicity is only 6, whereas the next two peaks have a multiplicity of 24. I mean, if we were to look at the 1, 0, 0, the 2, 0, 0, and the 4, 0, 0, you can see the kind of drop-off in intensity you get where the multiplicities are all the same. Right? Those are the factors we've already talked about. But then the multiplicities, of course, do make a difference. Here where we see 
this peak is weak and then a little bit stronger and then stronger still as we're going to higher angle, which is kind of going against the trends of the other terms we've talked about so far. But we can see that the multiplicity is going from 8 to 24 to 48. All right, so multiplicity is something you have to take into account when analyzing powder diffraction patterns. And, you know, the computer programs do this for you. It's worth noting that, of course, if we were now to go to a tetragonal crystal, where A and C are different, then, you know, the 0, 0, 1 is no longer the same as the 1, 0, 0. And so the multiplicities change as we change to different crystal systems. The last term in our intensity equation was something called the absorption correction. And the idea of the absorption correction is we have to account for the fact that x-rays tend to be strongly absorbed by matter. And so as an x-ray travels through a sample, if we're doing something in a transmission mode, let's say like we put our sample in a capillary, and we do a Debye shear experiment where the x-ray beams go through the capillary before they reach the detector, then you know, this path length of the x-rays through the matter, through our sample, is going to lead to some attenuation of the beam. So that's also going to affect our peak intensities. Depending on the material you're looking at, the wavelength of your radiation, uh, the geometry of your experiment, the absorption effects could be quite large. Now, if you have a strongly absorbing sample, in fact, all of the scattering comes from just the outside layer or skin of your sample. And so you can imagine at low angles, only the x-rays that are being scattered off the very top and the bottom of the sample, which have a minimal path length through the sample itself, are going to make it to the detector. Whereas if we go at very acute angles, there are more x-rays that can scatter without passing through much of the sample. So there's an angular dependence to the absorption correction. And for this kind of experiment, a Debye shear transmission experiment through a capillary, the effect is largest at low 2 theta angles, and it gets smaller as we go to high 2 theta angles. And so it's going to impose a theta-dependent variation in the intensities. I'm going to follow up this lecture with a short lecture on absorption corrections for this kind of experiment, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. The more common kind of experiment that we do in powder diffraction is probably the Bragg-Brentano geometry, where the x-rays are scattered off the surface of our sample. In that case, we have very different considerations for the absorption correction. We haven't talked very much about the optics in this kind of experiment, but when the x-rays come out of the source, the beam is actually diverging. So it's not just all parallel beams. But then you get to the sample, and because of the optics here, that refocuses the beam back to a same point at the detector. Now there's some optics here, which I've just called incident beam and diffractive beam slits. And if we look a little more closely at those, we can see what's going on. So here's our x-ray source. You know, at the x-ray source, which is, for example, a piece of copper being bombarded by electrons, x-rays are coming out in all directions. But what we really want is we only want the x-rays that are sort of parallel to the plane of this drawing, in this plane. We don't want the x-rays that are going up or shooting off in a downward direction. So you go through solar slits. These are thin metal plates that are closely spaced on both sides of the sample, and that basically takes out the x-rays that are diverging up or down. Then you have something which is called a divergent slit, and that's going to determine the area of the sample that's being irradiated by x-rays. Um, then you go through some more slits to get to the detector, which are kind of just a mirror of the slits that are on the incident beam side. The detector slit here is one where, depending on the width of the detector slit, you can have a trade-off between resolution to some extent and intensity. So a narrow detector slit is going to give you somewhat more narrow peaks, and a wider detector slit will cause the peaks to broaden a little bit, but it will give you more intensity. The key thing for our absorption correction, though, is to think about, well, what about the area of the sample that's being hit by x-rays? So you could probably imagine in this divergent beam 
geometry that when the sample is at low angles, the length of the sample that's irradiated is going to be larger than when it's at high angles. And we can do kind of a snapshot of our sample and look at how much of the sample is being irradiated. So in these drawings, the blue area represents the area of our sample, and then the pink area is the area that's being hit by the x-rays. And at low angles, we see there's rather a long length of the sample that's being bathed in x-rays. But because they're coming at this kind of uh, rather shallow angle, they don't penetrate very deeply into the sample. If we were to go to a higher 2 theta angle, the optics are such that the length that's being irradiated gets smaller and smaller as we go to higher and higher angles. But that's compensated by the fact that because the x-rays are coming at more acute angles, they penetrate more deeply into the sample. So these two effects basically cancel each other out, and so we can say that the volume that's being irradiated doesn't change very much with angle. And so when you're doing a Bragg-Brentano experiment, we don't have to make corrections for absorption. That is unless the surface is rough, and when the surface is rough, then that does tend to reduce the intensities of the low angle peaks because that roughness means that some x-rays that are coming at low angles travel through more of the sample than would occur at high angles. There are two maybe considerations we should think about when doing a diffraction experiment. First of all, at low angles, we don't want the irradiated area to spill over the, the area covered by the sample. So by picking the right divergence that you can avoid that. At very low angles, actually, the length here is quite large. A telltale sign of that in your diffraction pattern is you'll see some kind of hump or background at low angles that drops off as you go to higher angles. And that usually means that you are spilling over your sample. And when you do that, this cancellation between the irradiated area and the depth of penetration, that, that's kind of messed up, right? So your low angle peaks are going to be not sufficiently intense. They're going to be artificially too low in intensity. The other thing is we want to make sure that the depth of our sample is such that the x-rays are not you know, getting to the bottom of that. We don't want the x-rays to go all the way through the sample because that's also going to mess this up. Now we're going to get into this more in the next lecture, but here let's just look at how far the x-rays might travel through a material. Here I'm using copper K alpha radiation, which has a wavelength of 1.54 angstroms. And I'm looking at how much the beam is attenuated if it passed at a 90 degree angle through a material. And so we can see that for something like nickel oxide, just a representative transition metal oxide or transition metal compound, that the attenuation is almost complete by the time we get to maybe 0.2 millimeters. Right, so you only need a very thin layer then to make sure you don't go all the way through the sample. But if you have something that's entirely organic, here I just use diamond as an example of something that only has light elements, you can see that even after a, a centimeter, there's still 20% of the sample that has not been absorbed. So in those cases, you know, probably a transmission measurement would be better than a reflection measurement. All right, that's all I want to say for this lecture. In the next two lectures, we're going to, first of all, have a short lecture about absorption effects and how to think about those in uh, capillary experiments where you're doing uh, Debye shear geometry and powder diffraction. And then the next lecture, we'll get into the structure factor in more detail, and we'll see how that tells us about where the atoms are located in the unit cell.